Internet Vikings World of Experts. Hi, everybody, and welcome to, to this webinar about the iGaming and online sports market in the U.S. And with me today, I have uh, Rickard Wikström, the, the founder uh, of Internet Vikings and, and one of the really veterans in, the, in this industry, being running hosting for the iGaming industry for the last 20 years. And, and everyone knows Rickard, and Rickard knows everyone. So everyone. So it's not like, like the monkey uh, that everyone knows, but he knows no, nobody. With, with Rickard, it's the opposite. And it's a fantastic guy, and I'm happy to be chairman in Internet Vikings and have had the opportunity to, to meet and, uh, and work with Rickard. And we also have uh, Irina Kvakwa Vilas, uh, uh, responsible for, for regulatory affairs within Internet Vikings. And I would say the expert in the brains when it comes to this subject, the U.S. market, living in New York, soon celebrating Thanksgiving, I think it is, and, and waiting for the winter. So <laughs> with that, everyone, uh, welcome. Thank you. And Hi, yeah, everybody. I, yeah, I think I would like to hand over to you because we, we want to do a kind of a recap. Where, where is U.S. today in, in terms of states, license, and, and, and also the difference between the sport, sportsbook license with the online sports and, and iGaming. So I hand over to you. Uh, we have prepared a, a bit of a presentation. And please, throw in your questions and we will try to answer as many as possible. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jesper. Hi, everybody. Once again, thank you for joining us today. We are in November, which means that it's the perfect time to recap the year and also see what the next year will bring us. So we have tried to um, to put together um, a good overview of, of the regulatory market, as well as the revenue and predictions uh, for 2023 and 2024. So let's start with uh, 2023 uh, and what this year has brought us so far. Um, there's different ways to uh, count how many, uh, how many states are. Um, how many states have online legal sports betting? Um, here we're talking about the states that allow sports, uh, uh, that allow statewide uh, sports betting made from mobile. And this year has been good to us so far. Uh, we have three more states that have joined the cohort of online sports betting. There were total states that, uh, there were nine total states that attempted to do so, but they failed at different um, stages during the legalization process. So so far, we only have three, Kentucky, North Carolina, and Vermont. And Elena, what, which are the states that failed? Uh, there, there have been a bunch. There was Minnesota, Missouri, there was Texas and Georgia, even Hawaii at some point. Um, but um, again, they, they all failed at different stages. And those are the three that succeeded. Yeah, but and th this is interesting because are they failing forever or will they come back? Because that would kind of show a trend of, of going forward as well. Absolutely, some states do pass it on the first try. Some states take a couple rounds um, to to grasp the interest from the lawmakers. Also, like political climate changes, you know, economical climate changes. So there are different circumstances around in each specific state. Uh, but we'll talk about twenty twenty four um, outlook a little bit later on. Yes. When it comes to iGaming, there were also four states that tried to to make the iGaming laws legal, but unfortunately, not a not not a single one of them have passed. Um, so we're still at six states with online casino and seven states with online poker. But um, this year was not a complete bust for iGaming. Um, as of November 14, West Virginia has signed onto multi-state inter. In, internet gaming agreement, which means that now West Virginia, Delaware, Michigan, New Jersey, and Nevada can all share the pool of, play, of players that want to play an online poker. As you know, it's very hard to do, um, to do it within one state, given that the population is not, is not that high. Uh, but now they're sharing the pool, so they're able to... Um, to, lever to leverage um, the amount of states within this and, and This is something we will follow uh, when we do this next year as well, because th that is uh, perhaps a much more interesting fact than, than many people uh, think about, because poker, as we know it, is, is, is kind of a pool game uh, in the sense that you need a lot of players 
for it to kind yeah. of develop. So this is something we will look into and follow statistically and see how the poker market is developing in in US now when when you have this over uh, uh, state possibilities of, of pooling yeah. liquidity. Yeah, absolutely. And what makes this um, the situation even more interesting is that um, all of West Virginia does not have any legal online poker app so far, even though it's been legal for a while. And not a single major app has expressed interest in entering the market so far. But potentially with the West Virginia joining this compact and now there's a pool of uh, players from five states, we're hoping that this can change in future. And as Pennsylvania and Connecticut still remains on the sidelines, we are hoping that you know, West Virginia join could make Pennsylvania reconsider a decision in the future. So it's definitely an interesting topic that, um, that we will be following. So we might see a, 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 a comeback in the, in the online poker here in, in the U.S., Maybe, yep. Interesting, good. Um, another noteworthy mention, if we can move on to another slide, is um, the state of Florida. Um, yes, this is, my, this, is, this, is, this is really interesting for us, not, not being US-based and haven't followed this so, so carefully. And we, we, we also sort of have some, some European viewers here. So please, it's yeah. a battle in Florida. Yes. Um, it's the biggest state also with illegal online sports betting so far, even bigger than New York. It has relaunched Hard Rock Sports Betting app on November 7th, 2023, almost two years after it was originally launched. Seminola Tribe has been basically in and out of courts fighting the West Flagger Association. Basically, they are suing the state and the governor Ron DeSantis over the compact, arguing that it violates Florida constitutional amendment requiring statewide uh, voter approval of gambling expansion. And they also argue that it violates the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act because the bets aren't being placed on tribal lands because um, Hard Rock obviously wants you know, for it to be a statewide gaming. Um, Florida Supreme Court is expected to rule on the merits in the case possibly sometime in, in the first quarter of 2024. Uh, but until that time, existing users can use the Hard Rock app to place bets in the state of Florida and new users can join the wait list. So another very interesting development in, in the end of this year um, that we will also be following very closely and we'll see where it brings us. Thank you. That's, that's, yeah, it's a battle and it's interesting to see. And, and it, it's, yeah, we will know so pretty soon, hopefully. Yeah. Um, so let's move on. Um, we have talked a little bit about 2023 and before we jump into 2024, um, let's look at overall trends that we are, um, that we're seeing so far. Um, as you see, it all started in 2010, a long time ago, there was only Nevada. And then fast forward to eight years later, when Supreme Court struck down the federal ban on sports betting, allowing the states to legalize if they decide to do so. So in 2019, we have seen a huge spike in states that um, allow that allowed uh, legal online sports betting and legal iGaming. Um, ever since 2020, pandemic happened, 2021 has propelled that effort significantly as the states were looking for additional revenue to supplement their budgets. Since 2021, we have seen a steady increase of three states per year um, that allow online sports betting only so far. And we are, uh, based on the projections that we are looking, in 2024 um, and 2025, we are looking to add two or three states each uh, to this cohort which is Elena, before we, we before we go further i mean it's quite interesting to see here that has it has been zero i gaming states since 2019 and that's quite a long time yeah and and i know that you, you will come back to this but but when you look at this graph it stands out as it, it almost looked like a, a mistake they, they only managed to launch once and, and then forgot about it but that's not true fully and and we will come back to that but it's interesting to see here Definitely. Yeah, for sure. Uh, when we are looking at 2024, um, the, the new sports betting states, if we can skip to another slide, um, the 
as as we uh, as we mentioned, we are we are expecting at least two states um, to pass those online gaming laws. Um, and based on what we have seen um, in last um, year in 2023, um, Minnesota, Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, and Georgia have all attempted to pass this laws, but as you know, um, they all failed. So based on that, we are uh, we are expecting Minnesota and Missouri to actually succeed in 2024. They are um, they have gone the furthest out of all those states. So we do think that there will be another um, another try at legalizing online sports betting. Unfortunately, everybody was uh, looking to Texas, but um, as it did not as it did not become legal in 2023 and Texas legislature meets every other year. So there is no hope of legalization until 2025, which is um, unfortunate. Uh, But we also have Oklahoma, Georgia, South Carolina, and Hawaii that are likely to introduce the bills again in 2024. Um, They failed at pretty early stages last year. Um, and it will be an election year um, in the U.S. Um, so we are not expecting them to succeed again. But we'll see. And there's always there's always surprises when it comes to um, this kind of thing in the U.S. Good, but we we're hitting over thirty states here soon, and and I mean the the, the trend is is quite clear. That there will be more online sports betting uh, states opening up over the the next three to four years, definitely, and and some over the next year. Yeah, wouldn't it be sure. like my, my view on it? It's like, uh, like you said, it's an election year uh, next year. And it's, as you said, it's a very political matter. And because of that, like, I hope, and I know a lot of people within the industry hope it would be, will be a little bit of a ketchup effect in 25, like the sp- spring of 25, there'd be a lot of things happening uh, during that time, but also during the whole uh, 2025 which would hopefully for the industry mean that there will be a lot of new states coming coming online. So 25 will be, will be the new new 2019. That's good. <laughs> That's the hope, yes. Yeah. Um, and then we were talking about iGaming. Um, as we have touched on briefly, um, there was a good momentum this year to pass um, iGaming laws in four states as you you all see them on the map, but all those efforts were futile. New Hampshire came the closest, but in the end, it was not going to happen. And what we're seeing is that iGaming appears to be a very hard sell for the lawmakers in the U.S., and that happens for um, for a few reasons. Again, the industry experts say that a lot of states still have leftover federal government funding from post-COVID, but that is expected to run out in the next year or so, 2024, 2025, and the local lawmakers will be looking for additional budget funds. But also a lot of Americans, it's no surprise, they have favorite sports teams, they have game days, they come together, and um, betting on sports seems like such an obvious option, while online casino gambling seems a little bit something niche and, you know, maybe that not um, a lot of people are going to do. So um, we don't expect any new states in iGaming in 2024, uh, most likely 2025, but there's definitely an interest that we think um, is going gonna, is gonna to come in a year or so. Yes. And we have a, a slide further further down here that underpin, uh, underpinning that, that, that claim. So what will you come to that? So here yeah. are the states launched. Um, yeah, regulation is good and all, but um, let's talk about actually the revenue that um, these laws are bringing. So we had quite a few launches this year, along with the Florida swooping in at the end. But we do have Ohio, Massachusetts, Kentucky, Maine, and Florida. And as you see, Ohio is going very strong ever since the launch day. Ohio is about the same size as New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and it's in that top three um with them coming very closely. Massachusetts is doing good, although Massachusetts is half as small. And if you consider that 10% of adult population um, actually place uh, betting on sports, those are still really good 
numbers. There's still uh, no data for Kentucky um, and Maine as they launched only recently, but we are expecting to um, those revenue numbers to be in line with uh, what we have seen so far based on the population size and the interest. Um, Kentucky, perhaps even more so, at least um, or at least just as much as Massachusetts, giving a huge interest um, in gaming in that state. Um, so stay tuned to our update in Q1 2024 for those revenue date numbers. Okay, a question there. Do you think we will see Florida numbers? Do you think that that will be published? Because oh, absolutely. The, okay. They yeah, there's be. there's already yeah, there's already numbers for the handle. Um no no revenue data yet, but handle already shows us that it's still that is is already making a pretty good volume and again there is a limitation that it's only to the existing users you know yeah. so no new users can sign up and there is only one platform uh, which also limits um sports betting accessibility to a lot of um to a lot of people um well, so do yeah. we know how definitely many in q1 for it is that is that public have you Seen anything about? Yeah. Uh, I have not. I have not seen the data yet for that. No. So would have been. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it will take a second. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and then when we are, we have, a, we have a question here that 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 really fits into this narrative here. So uh, Chris Smith is asking California, any chance that you guys see on the next ballot initiative since they killed it last time? What what's your view on that? Yeah, California is going to try to reintroduce it again next year, but a lot of experts are saying that it's probably one of the least likely states, very close to Utah, that has no legal game at all to legalize it in the next three to four years, unfortunately, um, but probably, probably not. Yeah. And isn't it also that like the need to align so many different uh, organizations within California. That was the issue they had last year. That they there was too many fights around it. And I think it was it like yeah, like twelve percent or something. Like they got like yeah, something like that. It was like nothing. Um, yeah. And yeah, there is a lot of tribes in California. Yeah, and they all need to be in agreement with a state to reach. Um, yeah, to actually reach an agreement. Uh, and plus, the voters also have to have to agree to the to this new legislation which makes it even harder because um, there is a huge problem in california obviously that is related to homelessness um and you know people being pushed over the verge of poverty every single day so that's definitely um a lot of the californians that i know um they all voted no because of that because they they just think that it's going to make um those social issues even worse Good. Got some clearance there. I hope that, that, yeah, two thumbs up from Chris there. So I think that was a really good answer. Uh, thank you, Helena. Uh, perfect. So let's move on. Uh, yeah, we've talked about 2023 launches. Um, we also have to say so far that are going to launch in 2024. Um, the next one is going to be Vermont that is likely to launch in January. We don't have a date yet. Um, and then North Carolina that will launch in the first half of the next year without a date so far yet. Vermont is very, very small. Um, so we don't expect this launch to be um, anything groundbreaking. But um, North Carolina has a significant population. So North, North Carolina has definitely um, a potential to be to be one of the big uh, one of the big states when it comes to online sports betting. Good, yeah. Vermont looks small, even for a Swede. Sorry for that, Vermont. That was <laughs> <laughs> uh, says more about Sweden. Uh, okay, good. I mean, but the, the 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 thing here is that on the sportsbook side or the online sports betting, we see how how things are moving along along in a certain pace, so to speak. And and there's a there's a there's a trend, and and we are now above thirty states. So, and. We most likely not hit all states. It will not be a one hundred percent penetration. Uh, but still, there are still at least, in in my view, another eight, nine, ten state, states to to open up at least. And and then yeah. you have a rather com complete uh, online sports market in the US. I would say. Yeah, and they say that the 
Predi- Even more. predictions for the next yeah five ten states is that we'll have another ten states um, yeah. that have legalized online sports betting. So um, yeah, that's those are pretty good. Um, that's a pretty good coverage of uh, of the US when it comes it to is. online it sports is. betting. Yeah, yeah, and then if we're looking at the gross revenue um, here on the slide, we're seeing that. It, it grows, you know, quarter over quarter, and then year year over year, it's all it all keeps growing across all the verticals: i gaming, sports betting, table games, um, and slots. So, you know, um, gaming still remains a very um, inflation resistant industry, and we're seeing that, um, and we're seeing that in the numbers every single month. Yes, and yeah, I mean, it, it, these are super strong growth numbers, and and I, they they will of course continue. In in that sense, the U.S. market is still pretty young, and with young markets, you will basically, if you learn from from Europe, uh, you see a transition from from land based and from kind of illegal gambling into the into the uh, land based or sorry into the online gambling, and and that will continue for years to come. I mean. If we take Sweden, which is one of the most mature markets, we had this growth for like 15 years, 10 to 15 years yeah. with, with every year growth, uh, year on year growth. Um, not because more people were gambling, but more people started gambling online, yeah. and and yeah. and were also also kind of uh, canalized into from black market gambling and illegal gambling into regulated gambling. So and, and this will continue. So I, I my view here is that, or my prediction here is that. These these growth numbers will continue, definitely. For sure. And then, sure. Sorry, and then underneath, you have, there's a strong underlying growth as well when it comes to the two to GDR, also including land base. So, so there's a, there's momentum for gaming in, in in the US right now. Do we know uh, do we have any numbers on uh, how many? Uh, what's the online sports betting percentage uh, in the in the US? I know in Sweden it's like ninety percent. Of everyone betting or game uh, doing gambling is doing it online. Do you have any number for that in the US? I don't have a percentage off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, I would expect it to be in line with uh, with the rest of the world when it comes to eye gaming in the states where that's it's allowed. Yeah. For, for, for next time, yeah. we have this one of those webinars because that also indicates that I actually, Alien, I, I want to contradict you. I think it's it's a bit lower than than in Europe because the the industry is so young. So so uh, the tech. Mature, majority of the technology using tech and, and mobiles and so they are 100% the same but since the industry is a bit younger I, I still think there's a, uh, uh, a lower online pickup in the US market than, than in many mature uh, European market like, like England and, and Sweden and, and others uh, but that's also a good thing because that means that the online market will grow even faster and have a longer uh, growth period than, than I mean in Sweden the online market grows basically with GDP right now because yeah everyone is playing online uh, of of the people playing so so that's an interesting data point see if we can if we can get that to, to the next webinar we have yeah absolutely uh, but yeah speaking about iGaming if we move on to the next slide yeah we see that um, there is a huge revenue growth um, in the states that are legal and same for sports betting that um, they just the numbers just keep. Uh, just keep going up. Top five um, in online sports betting shuffles back and forth. We had Ohio that launched that um, that was definitely in the top five for a while, um, and and still is. But um, but yeah, numbers numbers just keep going up. And we should, exactly what you're saying. And numbers keep going up, and they will probably continue going up for for the, the, the reasons we talked about. And and looking at this graph to the right side there. It's quite impressive. It's the same. It's it's still the same number of states basically, and and it has been growing within this. So this is an organic growth, while the the sportsbook growth is a bit, it's two dimensional. It's it's an organic growth in every state, but there's also new states coming in. So the uh, and we can see that on the next slide how how I think Elena, this one uh, how strong the the eye gaming is, and, and this is why I believe that more and more states actually will regulate over time. Uh, if you look at this, there's 7.1 billion in revenue online sports betting, and there's approximately uh, uh, 4.4.4 and a half billion in, in online. 
the 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 the, the sports betting is on 29 states. Uh, I don't know. Do the math. It's like 200 something uh, million in in average per state, and and six states for 4.9. That's something like 600. So so the 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 average revenue number is x3 on online gaming. And of course, when 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 regulators and 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 state lawmakers realize this and see where where the tax money actually are hidden or or where, where there's a possibility of tax money, I believe they will start opening up these markets as well. And and especially seeing how, how it works in other markets. And and if you take the the, the 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 learnings from Europe, compulsive gambling and problematic gambling is not increasing. It's the same level. I mean in, in most European countries it's between two and four percent of, of of the the adult uh, population ha- are in risk or are a, a problematic gambler, and and half percent, percent uh, half percentage point is is compulsive gambling. Now it's been the same for the last thirty years, and long, long, long away before we had online gaming, and and now we have online gaming, and it's still the same. So when lawmakers see this and actually have the data on this, and and not. What, what you think or what you believe, but actually data, I think more and more states actually will open up. And yeah, so I, I think these numbers talk to themselves somehow in that, in that sense. Absolutely. Yeah, and the six states is basically four. four, four. Exactly. <laughs> if you look at the, or yeah. three, depends how you see it. Uh, so it's uh, a lot. Yeah, so no, no, it's a huge... And this also means that people like to gamble. They they like this is an entertainment. They like to do it, and and that's an, also another aspect into this. As long as you you do it in a secure way, and and it also canalizes gambling into a, a controlled and and regulated environment. Uh, so so now I think we will see this going forward, and then more and more of these states will will open up. Perhaps not all. Perhaps not as as you said before. The, the online sport is such an integrated part of, of the U.S. society. You, you meet them on, on Sundays, you look at Sunday game, you, you, you bet, and you have been betting even before it was regulated, and you have played your fantasy games, etc., etc. So, yes, that will be bigger, and perhaps should be bigger. But once again, I think four or six states is, is a small number when it comes to, to I casino. Yeah, and if you think about population numbers, uh, basically six states equates to 13% of the U.S. population. If you think about it, only legal online gaming, iGaming, is only available for 13% of all yeah. the U.S. population. It doesn't. It doesn't really add up. So you, it's not necessarily about you know adding, um, you know, adding an online casino. It's more about sometimes bringing, you know, those people over from the gray markets onto yeah, exactly. the white markets yeah. and making sure that they have yeah. protections and the tax revenue is yeah. is going into the budgets. And, and when it comes to the U- so. yeah, sorry, the, uh, w- w- when it comes to the U.S. market, it's not even gray market; it's black market because you're absolutely not yeah. allowed to, to offer you your. You, you, your service to, to to U.S. players. So so it's and and, and we also know that the, the level of responsible gaming and and security is so much lower with most, not with everyone, but with most of the back operators. So so that's a reason. And we have a question here. It's a pre-submitted question that we got before. Where do you see the future of offshore operators as the U.S. slowly continues to regulate and legalize online gaming across the states? It's Chris again. Uh, thank you for that, Chris. It's a it's it's a really good question, and uh, it, it is as we, we we talked about. I mean, one of the main reasons to regulate is is to canalize gambling into a controlled and, and, and safer environment that the government controls. You can set up a, a set of rules to how to behave, how to treat play, players, how to do uh, treat them with, with players with problems, how to to check for money laundering and, and responsible gaming and, and, and all this. And that's super important part of legislation. And other parts is, of course, taxation and, and such. And, and so, so the answer lies in this, that the more you open up, the less black and, and, and gray gambling in, in other markets will we, we, be there. Because there's no reason for me to do the hustle and take the risk of going into a rather unsecure and unsafe site when I can log on into something that I know works. And uh, some part of my winnings will go to tax. 
I'm not winning less. I'm not paying more, basically. But it's the the the, the gaming operator that pays the tax. And and honestly, taxation is a good thing. Without taxation, th there would be a lot of things that we couldn't do. Then then you shouldn't overtax. That's another thing. But but still, so so there's so many reasons for me as a player to actually choose these regulated sites rather than unregulated sites. And and so opening up is a way, as Elena said before, to kind of push these sites away. So I think that we get more and more difficulties for these sites the more the more regulators are opening up for, for regulated or for the, yeah, approved sites in, in, in each state. But <clears throat> my, my take on that is like, yes, and like slowly, I think is the key word here, mm. like continues to regulate. Like this is the problem because if we would have not 29 states, but 49 states, that have legalized and also on the casino side that's like if that would be a lot more than what we're currently seeing like we wouldn't ha have the issue of uh like, like black gaming in the us because that's the easiest way to battle that is by getting so it's not what was it 30 uh, 16 percent 13 13 percent um that's now can do uh, like the scene online. Like of course. Yeah, the, the rest, if they want to play, they have to play black sites, and that's not a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and and then you can say, yeah, but they shouldn't be able to 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 offer the sites into the US market. Well, they are. Yes, face it, they are. So so and and this is also very important for for the regulators listening into this this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, it's also very, very, uh, and we've seen this in Europe and in, in certain markets, it's extremely important that you regulate in a balanced way. Because if the customer offering is worse on the regulated, I mean, me as a customer, if I can't get my games there and it's uh, it's too difficult to, to log on and there are too many restrictions on bonuses, etc., etc., some players will still go black because they, they get their bonuses and they get the certain games and so forth. So, so finding a balance on the regulation is also extremely important. My view is that in the US, this is not a problem. Uh, I, I would say that the, the US operators have the opportunity they, they need to cater for and, and canalizing or channelizing the, the, the players into their, their site. But like once it is the contradict this is how you do KYC in the US is still a very uh, I guess a problematic process because you need like there is scanning, there's patch, but there's a lot of steps that you need to go through compared to let's say Sweden, where you all log in with a half state controlled ID system. Yeah, but that's because we have a, a yeah, but it's not something like, like that in the US. Yeah, exactly. No, no, you, you, you're right. But you can't make it too cumbersome to, to be a customer because then people will pop off to, to other yeah. places. But still, I think I think that that, that should work. Uh, we got a question about crypto. And do we know anything about that, Elena, where, where regulators are on, on uh, crypto as a payment method? <laughs> Um, yeah, I did not see any news recently about you know crypto um, entering um, gaming gaming market in the U.S. Um, crypto has had pretty bad press lately in the U.S. Um, so I do yeah. I do not believe that yeah it's on um, you know anybody's immediate um, list of things to legalize, but we'll see. Maybe one day it will change. Mm. Yeah, I, I think crypto is, is kind of a, it has to prove itself to to being a, a function. It's functional, but but also to yeah. be a kind of a, 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 a prudent currency, so to speak. If you excuse my bad English here, uh, but but I think you understand what I mean. And 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 that will take some time more. And and it's not only the U.S. regulators. There are also a lot of other regulators are very kind of we we wait a bit. Let's see what happens. And so crypto becomes by default a non-regulated uh, currency. That might be a reason to regulate it and, and so forth. But but let's see. N not, not next year, I would say. Yep. <clears throat> Good. Uh, let's see. This one. We have this one also talking about how to block. Uh, I, I can, what, what, mean, uh, what means are available to the authorities in the key states to combat uh, the black market, such as IP blocking, payment blocking, games blocking. And I can say, like, from a technical perspective, like, the regulator are doing a good job. They go after suppliers, vendors. Like, it is going very well. Like, they are doing it. 
the problem is that these are like the, these companies are making so much money from it. So you need to make it more difficult to do it. You can't that like, payment. Okay, then they have a guy coming over to their homes with cash if they're winning. Games blocking. Okay. Um, you have thousands and yeah. thousands of and you just build new games. Yes, just copy games. IP blocking, same thing. So I think like the only way to do it, it's basically to provide a better service and to um, and to show that this is actually for a good thing. And then it will hopefully solve itself. Not tomorrow, but within within the next decade. And you my my opinion on this is that you need to have the long perspective on it and every day but going against trying to find these companies that supply both unlicensed and licensed uh like being a supplier for both sides and go after them yes mm-hmm. work on that in yeah. each and every case yes and this is such a, a broad and difficult topic i mean in sweden we have successfully launched uh spiel stop which is a it's a a, a, a government Uh, driven function where I can block myself as a player and I'm blocked on all uh, regulated sites at the same time. If I block myself from one site, I'm blocked on everyone. And, and this is, of course, an, an amazing tool for, for people with the with, uh, tendency of, of gambling too much and, and problematic issues with, with gambling. However, a lot of them can't really get, get rid of the urge. They want to gamble again and they can't get to their sites. So they go black. And, and so what, what you create here is a way to push them out. Initially, it was an amazing thing. You have like kind of 100,000 people blocked themselves from gambling. That would have been amazing if they stopped gamble. Some does, absolutely, but not all. So my view here, and this is a bit contradictionary, it's a bit like swearing in the church, is that actually the Swedish regulated operators should be able to... to Uh, to let them play if they come back, but in a controlled way. Perhaps not let them play directly. Perhaps really ask them, are you really sure that you want to play? Okay. Uh, you know that you are blocked, so shouldn't you? And you still insist and say, yes, okay, let's start with $5 or $10 and keep it there. Uh, rather than just put them away to someone and say, wow, welcome. Here's a, we double your, your uh, um, deposits. You said 10,000, perfect. You get 20 from us. So, so, But doing that is kind of, for a lot of people, feels contradictory. So this is a, such a huge question, but it all started with being regulated and, and rather than, than blocking because these players will find their ways. They are addicted. They need to gamble. In that sense, it doesn't, it doesn't matter from other uh, uh, addictions where you need to have that, that, that rush or that kick or, or, or whatever is your... Your choice. So, so it's a difficult matter, but once again, it starts with being regulated. Yes, sorry, we we are <laughs> being off a bit. Uh, uh, yes, we have another question here. Is the social gaming market growing as much as online sports betting and iGaming? Uh, are there regulatory considerations around launching and, and opening a social casino? Yeah, this is a really interesting question and, and something I am. And I'm advising companies back and forth. This is a question that comes up a, 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 a lot of the times. Uh, I don't have any data right now on, on how fast it's growing. It's a growing market. It's a, it's, a, it's a very lucrative market. And it's not regulated in the sense that you can't lose money, which you can, but, but uh, uh, you're not gambling. You can't win money. So basically, if you can't win, you can't lose. But you still have to pay him somehow either by credit or, or the, um, um, yeah, yeah, there's an advertising revenue as well. But I don't foresee any regulations in, in the other markets where, where we are uh, active right now. Elena, is that the difference when it comes to the U.S.? Uh, yeah, no, you are you are right that uh, when it comes to social casinos, you know they uh, they are their own thing. Yeah, as long as there is no actual you know money that is being bet involved, that it's not. It's not regulated right now, but yeah, as you as you said, like um, it can be a very interesting option for some of the companies to enter the U.S. market, you know, and to go yes. after that player base. Um, and a lot of those companies, you know, implement their own you know sources of revenue either via ads or via in-app purchases. So it's still a very lucrative 
Um, yes, I'm a bit surprised. I'm a bit surprised that there's relatively few utilizing this opportunity of of being ahead of the curve. And and once again, we saw this with the fantasy games companies, the big ones today, uh, how, how they kind of had the player base when 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 it opened up for for online sports. And the same, if you have a social gaming casino, that is of course an amazing way to then turn these players above 18 years into into becoming gamblers and customers to your to your uh, regulated casino or your real money casino. Uh, yeah, you have to gamble on which states are opening up, and hopefully you're listening to this <laughs> seminar and you, you get a better idea. And we'll call Elaine or email her and, and ask her what her predictions are. And, and then you run a social casino there. You, you get your brand out there. You even might, might make some money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think more and more we'll we'll look into this opportunity. But, but Elena, haven't it been a lot? Some of the regulators being going after uh, social casinos and. There's been some other uh, verticals of the like non-regulated gaming space that have been drawing some attention lately. I think for us, saw, saw something about. Not like, to my recollection, yeah. there was definitely um, there is definitely a lot of debate and conversation in a lot of fantasy sports, but not so yeah. much and about sweet social sweet and sweet states. Yeah, yeah. sweet states. Yeah, sweet states. Yeah. 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 You're referring to, yeah. Yeah. but not not so much the the. The, the social casino and the social casino is basically the the, the, the app store and, and Google Play yeah. built on this. So it's a huge, it's a huge market, but it's also a huge phenomenon itself. People are playing every day, uh, so it's a big market. Yes. But Elia, what, what's your view on sweepstakes and the regulators? Who will win? Will anyone? Anyway? <laughs> uh, hopefully, the market will win in the end. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we will uh, we will have to see. There's definitely a lot of discussion from the from the regulators going on about what is the best way to move forward. Um, we will. I I do think that there will be more news coming out of it um, coming out of it next year. Yeah. Good. Uh, let's see here. We, we can continue with some questions. We are we are almost there anyway, aren't we? We're gonna hand over to Rika for a while and talking a bit about cybersecurity. Um, Yes. We do have a good question related to yeah, cybersecurity record. To be post that question, and I hand over to you, Elena, and you hand over to to Rika. Yeah, <laughs> briefly go through the, the the regulatory framework for for hosting because that differs a lot from from Europe, where where you can basically cloud host wherever you want, and 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 you can offer this to if you have a license, you can Sweden, Germany, England, and and so forth. Why in the US it's much more state by state? Yeah, um, in the US again, uh, federal federal court does not decide on iGaming. You know, ever since the ban was struck, it's been always up to the states. And you know, and the more states, just uh, just as you and I talked uh, yesterday, Jasper, the more states decide for themselves that they want to offer online gaming, the harder it will be. For there to be like a federal, yes. a federal law, and like again, due to nature, you know, of the U.S. as a country, a lot of issues are being decided on a state by state basis, and because, and it does make sense in a lot of ways because it's a huge country, and you know, there are a lot of states that want to keep that iGaming revenue for themselves, and by by making these companies host inside a single state. Um, they are tap. They are tapping into that revenue, which absolutely mm -hmm. makes sense. But, um, but yeah, it does make cybersecurity um, so much more so much more complex. And Rickard, if you want to talk about the last slide that we have, and we have a question from Dan here, in the light of the increasing importance of cybersecurity, what measures and the best practices do you recommend to safeguard against DDoS attacks? That's a good question, and that's a nice piety over long as you say in Sweden to to Rika. Yeah. That's a nice handle what that means. Yes, please, Rika. Yeah. No, but it, it, it's a very good question, and uh, like uh, Lena was saying, you need to have it in each and every state um, for sports betting. Of course, for uh, iGaming, gaming, you it's per state regulation, and just to add on to that, we talked a lot about ta uh, tax revenue, and I. Don't don't know how many hours Elena and a little bit me have spent on trying to figure out uh, tax like how where we need to pay tax in each and every state in the U.S. because we operate in 23 states. So 
It's like, okay, where do we need to pay tax? What tax? And because there's all different taxes in each and every state. And that's also state revenue, right? It's also revenue to the yes. state. And that's and this is one of the few industries in the world that say, please come and tax us. Give us more taxes because we have we're happy to pay it. And that's what we as a hosting company will do as well in each and every state. Um so it basically adds on to this uh, the tax revenue from the gaming industry. And that's also one of the reasons why there, there is a legislation to have. It's not only yeah. by security and, and controlling, it's also, yeah. Yeah. And, and, sorry, and, one, and sorry, one, one small thing to say as well. And as it, there will also be states choosing not to offer iGaming or, or uh, online sportsbook. And, and that's also another reason why it will not be a federal law. So, so I, I think we are very, very far from the federal law where you can... Yeah, no, but it, run, won't, no, it, won't, it won't happen. happen. It yeah. won't, yes. The next decade, it won't happen because no. like, the states have the yes. power to decide this. Yes. Basically, they are... Uh, if we take the slide again, I can just jump back to the question. And I think that um, like what we are talking about is cybersecurity. Again, this is not anything um like it's not anything new it's things that i've been saying for the last two decades it's um and we can start from the top like importance of uh, disaster recovery like we had a question like one of the pre-submitted questions was regarding the mgm resort uh issue they had in september and like how I, my view on it is that the importance of disaster recovery the importance of having a server, a set of servers, an environment somewhere else or at the same location, but it's just not powered up. Because if there's one thing a hacker and a ransomware group cannot do, it's basically to physically plug in a cable, it's physically to uh, flip the switch on the server because like, it's a physical thing. You need to be there to do it. Um, so what I would like say to everyone is like, you, you should have, if you're running a multi-billion dollar business out of one rack, out of two racks in one data center, have a disaster recovery. Because you're literally betting your billion dollar business out, out of, of one place. Yeah, it's like this much service. It's yeah. like, it, it, it's crazy compared, if any other industry would, where you would say this, it's like, they would like not think it's for real. But and, then, can yeah. I, um, and regarding the disaster recovery, it's like the importance here is to have it so that the hackers cannot do it in another. And th but this is also why some states demand this. They have this as part of the regulation. Yes. yes. No, but the same New Jersey, you need to have a, 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 secondary. a, a yeah, secondary backup somewhere else outside of uh, where you have it. It's not a full disaster recovery. I am very sure that we will start seeing a lot more disaster recoveries ro rolling out not because maybe of the regulators come in and state it, also because like it's a sense of like sense of a smart decision as a business owner, as the board, to basically just that's demand. A, that's a typical CFO comment on the management meeting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Like, what's the risk? And you know, we're seeing with, with West Virginia that is like in the rules and regulations that you need to have two data centers. That's just it's just but broke. it's common sense, as yes. you say. It's yeah. common sense. Don't put uh, your million billion dollar business on, into one piece of plastic and chips. No, it's no. it's it's not especially in states like Pennsylvania, like Michigan, New Jersey, of course. But I think this will. Uh, yeah. And I understand a lot of like engineering department that haven't had focused on it for the past three years because we new states. You see, it's twenty nine states. It's like twenty states. The last for five years, like every every quarter is a new state. I understand. You don't have time to look back and see, okay, what's going on with old states? Old, um, so that's it. And another thing someone asked about the DDoS protection is like, it shouldn't be something extra. It should be, it's like asking like- Hygiene factor. Yeah, it's a hygiene factor. It's like, should you, should you have a firewall? Do, do I need a firewall? It's like, yeah, everyone knows that you need a firewall. For your like your home network, for your computer, for your network, your company network, 
it shouldn't be something extra. It should always be there. And that's my view on DDoS protection. You need to have it if it's like volumetric, like we offer that for free to all our customers. Is it like a WAF that I think should be added on top, uh, like a web application firewall? And that comes back to the to the third thing. It's like the easiest way to secure some like something from an external, uh, like secure and don't show uh, your attack vectors from outside. Is basically don't show your data center IPs. Like some, I spoke to one customer last week. It's like, don't do this. He's like, yeah, yeah. He's laugh, laughed about it. And it's like, yeah, of course I don't do that. And then I have so many other customers that are showing the data center IPs to everyone and anyone, like API dot uh, provider dot com, and then you have uh, the the IP address. It's like leaving your keys in your brand new Porsche, in or, or map to the key. <laughs> map to the key. Exactly. Yes, it's, yeah. it's uh, just it's the easiest way, and it, like you have Cloudflare, it costs like we're talking a few hundred dollars, up to a thousand dollar a month mm. to secure one uh, API endpoint. It's nothing in in the big point. If you, you have a WAF, you have everything in that kind of package. So don't do that. It's my one takeaway. I think disaster recovery, data protection is not extra, and don't show the data center IPs. Okay, three very uh, straight to the point tips from two decades of, of data cybersecurity experience. And, and they might sound obvious, but they are not. And, and please take this with you, do a checklist. And if you are the CFO, you just bring them on the next meeting, how much revenue will we lose if any of this happens? And the answer would be, oh, let's do this, uh, I would say. So um, with that, we open up for some more Q&As. Uh, where are we, Eliana? Do, do you have something that you want us to pop up? I need to read my, I need to have my glasses. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the use of skill games offer a great way to enter the social gaming space without the risk of regulatory uncertainty. And that's true. Absolutely, as long as you do it as skin, there are there are no uh, kind of there's no RNG into this one, and 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 it's a totally different uh, set of, of rules that apply. So that's a good tip, definitely. Um, uh, what strategic considerations and best practices do you recommend to ensure a successful entry into the iGaming and online sports betting space? Okay. Elena, that's yeah. your question. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say we have another question here that is very similar, so maybe we can combine them. Um, yes, in state-by-state -state revenue analysis, are there any regions that stands out as particularly uh, promising for iGaming and sports betting operators? Um, and my advice um, has always been is to follow the opportunity um, that, you know, the states are very different in terms of population, in terms of demographics, um, in terms of revenue, sometimes the amount of, you know, op uh, operators available, you know, what are the platforms, um, depending on the, you know, on the contract that you reach with your partner, um, the percentages, the revenue share can be different. So uh, my advice would be to um, to do to do what makes sense for you. Um, again, there's a lot of good states like the Big Five: um, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Michigan. Um, they all there is a huge market there, and it can seem uh, like in you know a no-brainer, especially because you know after you have a license and after you've been operating in those big states, it will be significantly easier to enter some of the smaller states because you've done your due diligence and the regulators um, are extremely thorough when it comes to, uh, to licensing application and background verification and all, um, and all kind of things. But uh, sometimes, you know, if there is a better opportunity in a smaller state, uh, maybe it makes, say, it makes sense to start with a state, you know, like uh, Vermont. Or, or Maine, um, I do feel like the bottom line is um, nobody knows your business and your opportunity better than you. Um, and the advice that I would give before entering the market is to make sure that you have all your ducks in a row, uh, meaning if you think that um, there could be a change in the board uh, or in, you know, in C-suite uh, executives, or is there any restructuring, mergers and acquisitions, think about it ahead of time 
Because when you submit those licensing applications, those those are all going to be examined. And again, any changes, it's just going to delay the process so much more. Um, and, you know, which means that the launch date is going to be, is going to be delayed. Um, so yeah, that would be my advice. Uh, what do you I think? Have, I, have small, you, I have a small story. I have a small story in regards to that. <laughs> I, I, I've been in, in numbers of these applications and I have to send in my bank details and, and my transactions and everything. It's like a page like this. And, and then I was asked to do this for Pennsylvania for one company. And then a year, two years later, whatever, I had to send in the same to Pennsylvania. And then comes this call, I think it was, or an email. Someone was asking me, excuse me, could you explain the difference between the first one you submitted and the second one you submitted? My answer was, yes, life. I mean, <laughs> your bank balance should <laughs> differs a bit between years. <laughs> so, yeah, life. Uh, and she actually took that as an answer. Uh, okay, but I, I I can follow up on that because I get this question quite often. Like, like because me and Elena, we've been doing it for the last three years. Like it's been like a lot of we learned a lot. I don't know if we can say that, Elena. Uh, and uh, what I would do is like don't stress it. Like if you feel, and I say this to everyone, like if you feel okay, somewhere in 2024 we want to do it. I had this discussion at Sigma last year. It's like, if you have someone, uh, or if you want to do it, start with it. Don't If you don't have the time to start with it, like, 100%, just put someone or yourself or someone two hours a week or yeah. something like that. Just investigate. Go to this webinar. Yeah, work with it and understand the opportunity. Just follow the market. Just see what kind of opportunities it is. And it could be there. And just learn about the market and then also... So, like so looking through the application process okay this is what i need to get like this is all the things because it's a very it's not a difficult process it just takes a lot of time uh to make to make sure yeah. you 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 become you get the license so you'll start with it and go through and see look through the legislation the requirements it's pretty easy just okay this is what we need okay then yeah. it's, it's a project it's a project yeah and and also another view from my side uh, advising companies into this and and uh, I, I mean infant vikings are in plus 20 states but started with one and i think that's the that's the one perhaps one of the main lessons here start with one do it right and and unless you're super big and have a very a, a lot of funding and, and, a, and a big staff of people, you can, of course, multiply this into, into more. But for most of us, whether it's a, an operator coming from Europe or even in, in the US or an affiliate or a, a provider of, of sort, I would start with one state and then take it from there because then, then you kind of have a chance to get your ducks in order with that state and they can back, go back and forth. And when it's much, so much easier going to the next state and the next state and the next state. Then you can do three or four or two or whatever. But I would start with one. Not like us that did 23 states in two and a half years. No, but you still started with one. <laughs> yeah, we started with one, but then we scaled rapidly. Exactly. I, I, I can just say I'm super thankful to everyone, the Internet Vikings team, to see how we can... Uh, that we managed to do it. Good, let's see, what else do we have? We need to finish here in one minute. This has time flying when you're sitting with people like Rickard and Elena here. So, but <laughs> we, we take one more. Uh, what regulations are feared by the industry? Ah, what regulations are feared by the industry in the US in general and how well involved is the industry in discussing potential negative effects in relation to iGaming regulators? That is a really good question. Uh, Don, thank you for that. Uh, you're from Denmark, so, so you 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 see this close hand. Perhaps not so much in Denmark. I think Denmark has a very good regulation compared to other markets close by, uh, without saying too much. Um, uh, but this is... I don't know if operators are fearing anything. I think what you fear as an operator is regulations that you can't trust. They are changed every every year or every second year and and you take in that and you take out that and you add this and you remove this etc etc it's so difficult to run a business when you don't know the the the, the, the limits or, or the stakes at, at play so that's what you fear and 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 with that Rickard is now pointing at the watch it's five o'clock five o'clock he says so Don I'm sorry I, I we, we have to stop there mm -hmm.
And to all of you, thanks a lot for listening. Thanks a lot for the uh, 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 really brilliant and smart questions. And uh, Rickard and Elena, a big thank you to you. We are streaming to executives all around the world. All around the world. We know what issues they face. Listen to business insights from our experts. This, This is, is Internet Vikings.